Well, as all of you know, just three short months ago, my husband of 46 years went to his eternal glory. In God's providence, I was not able to be with him due to hospital regulations at that time. Also, I was not able to talk to him much uh, by phone during that time due to the fact of his declining health condition. I've often pondered in the last three months if I was able to see him and be with him by his hospital bed, what would be, have been his final admonitions to me? What would have been his final encouragement to me? What would have been the important things that he would have said to me that he would have wanted me to remember? Peter the Apostle, unlike my husband, <laughs> was told that he was soon going to die. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter left many admonitions and many encouragements for his readers. And ladies, we have been privileged by the Lord to be able to study this precious epistle together. And we have now come to Peter's final encouragement and his final admonition that he gives to the church that he's writing to. And so let's read the last two verses together and find out what that final exhortation is and what that final encouragement is. You therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Now, last week when we were together, we looked at 10 ways in which you and I are to live in view of the fact that the end of the world is coming. And they all started with the letter P. If you remember, we are to live in purity. We are to live in piety. We are to passionately wait for the coming of the Lord. We're to pray. We're to preach the gospel. We're to plan on moving. This isn't our home. We're going to heaven. We are to be persistent, to be at peace. We are to be perfect. We are to ponder the depth of our depravity, and we are to be proficient and persistent in Scripture so that you and I do not pervert the Word of God. And so as Peter closes out this epistle to his readers, he leaves them with a final exhortation in verse 17 and then a final encouragement in verse 18. So let's look at the final exhortation. What is Peter writing to these readers knowing, as the Lord has told him, he is going to put off his tabernacle. He's going to die soon. And so these are the words that are empowered by the Holy Spirit as he gives his final encouragement to his readers in verse 17. He says, you therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you all fall from your own steadfastness. Peter begins by saying, you therefore, beloved, beware. You understand, you know the dangers of perverting the truth. In fact, ladies, we've looked this year or this semester. Peter wrote a whole chapter, chapter 2, on the dangers of perverting the gospel, the dangers of false teacher. In fact, we saw last week he wrote, uh, he ended the verse 16 with the same thing. Those who pervert the scriptures, they, they bring destruction upon themselves. And so Peter says, you guys know this. You not only know about uh, 2 Peter chapter 2 that I wrote, but just the previous verse I wrote to you, beware lest you distort the truth. Why? Because you could bring destruction on yourself. In fact, we also saw in our le lesson last week, he warned them even in Paul's epistles. Some people were taking not only Peter's writings, but Paul's writings, and they're twisting things for their own pleasure. And so we saw how dangerous that is. And so Peter says, beware, my beloved, do not be ignorant of this. Ladies, this is something that you and I should not be ignorant of either. Uh, he says, in fact, Peter says here, you know this beforehand. In other words, you know this beforehand. You've been given warning. I'm telling you in advance, be careful. Ladies, we too have been warned of this. We've been warned of it throughout 2 Peter. I've heard many of you say that you didn't know there was so much about false teachers in 2 Peter, and we've been warned of this. And yet I have a question for you. How many of you are going to remember what we've learned in these 12 short weeks? 
Will you remember these precious truths that we have learned? Some of you, I'm not ignorant of this, and you shouldn't be ignorant, some of you will pervert the truth that we've heard. And some of you may pervert it to the point of destruction. And uh, there are many ways in which we do that. I mean, you think of it, think about those of you that have children, even though uh, they may be grown now, and those of you that have little kids now, think of all the things that you warn your children of. You tell them beforehand, like don't text and drive, right? Or don't drink and drive, right? Or just don't drink at all. Or uh, make sure you're faithful to attend church. Make sure you don't forsake the assembling. Make sure you're faithful to your walk to the Lord. Or make sure you choose your friends, friends very carefully. And yet with all those uh, warnings that you have given your children, how many of you that have grown children can sit here this morning and say, my child has followed every one of those warnings that I gave them? It's rare, isn't it? It's rare to warn your children and have them follow each one of those admonitions that you and your husband faithfully warned them of. And so that's why I know some of you, just like Peter knew, some of his readers, even though they've been warned beforehand, they're going to fall from their own steadfastness. They're not going to remain faithful. And so thank God that he uh, leaves us here with this warning. Ladies, Peter was clear in the beginning of his epistle that his purpose was to remind them of certain truths. Remember uh, back in chapter 1, verse 12, he says, For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you of these things. He said, even though you know them already, you guys know this, you're established in the truth. But Peter says, I'm not ignorant, even though the Lord's told me I'm going to die soon. He said, I'm not ignorant. I know you guys are going to forget some of these things that I tell you. And you know, when you think about it, Peter was really just following in the steps of his Lord. You know, Jesus discipled 12 men, right? And one of them we know was apostate, that was Judas. But uh, Peter was one that was discipled by the Lord. And you know, Peter is really just doing what his Lord did to the 12 disciples. Uh, Jesus passed on certain warnings to his disciples, and now Peter is doing the same thing, and he's passing on to his disciples. I think even in Matthew 24, a great example of this, when Jesus said to his disciples, he said, false Christ and false prophets are going to rise and show great signs and wonders, and if possible, they will deceive the very elect. And then he says right after that, see, I've told you beforehand. I'm telling you this beforehand. Peter was sitting right there. He heard Jesus say that. He warns them of false teachers. I've told you this. Listen up. Even in John 16 in the upper room, some of the last moments Jesus had with his disciples, and Peter was there. Peter was listening. In fact, he was the one with all the questions. He was the one that didn't want Jesus to, to just wash his feet but his whole body, you know, and he was the one that put his foot in his mouth. He had the foot and mouth disease. But uh, even in the upper room there, Jesus says, these things I've spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. He said, they're going to put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time is coming that whosoever kills you will think they're doing God a service. And he says, and all they, these things they do because they have not known me nor the Father. And then he says this, these things I've told you ahead of time, I'm telling you ahead of time. So when it comes, you'll remember about these. So Jesus was kind. He told his disciples, he warned them, Peter is kind by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's warning his readers. Ladies, we know too, right? We know this stuff beforehand. It's just not in Second Peter. You know, I was looking at Titus the other day and working on getting ready to teach that, and I was like, you know, they talk about false teachers, even in Titus. I think it's all throughout Scripture. And yet we've been warned beforehand, and how many of us will fall away? How many of us will pervert the truth? And ladies, not only do we need to be warned, but we need to warn others. We live in the heresy capital of the world. And uh, we need to be warning those that we come in contact with of the dangers of false teachers and the dangers of perverting the truth. Continually remind each other of what is true from God's word. So because of the fact that we know the dangers of false teachers, the dangers of perverting the truth, then notice what Peter says, beloved, beware Least you fall from your own steadfastness. Now, the word beware here means be on watch, be on guard. In fact, the Greek tense is be constantly on guard. Be constantly aware of this. Ladies, 
we live in a, a, we here at Grace Community Church, we're blessed to be in a, God, a sound biblical church. But you know what? Even though we are in a sound biblical church, there are times that we might hear something on the radio or on the internet or some well-meaning friend will tell us something and we'll think, well, that, that kind of sounds good. Maybe that, maybe I need to go that direction in my biblical thinking. And ladies, we need to be very careful. And Peter says, be constantly on guard, be constantly aware, measure everything you hear and read with this book right here. Be, go be on guard, do not let up. Now you might say, well, why must I always be on guard about my spiritual walk? Notice what Peter says. Be on guard, why? Least you also too fall from your own steadfastness. Ladies, if you're not on guard about your spiritual life, you're going to fall from your own steadfastness. I had one girl text me after, after last week's lesson, and she said, I am going to write all 10 of those peas and put them on my refrigerator. I do not want to forget how I am to live in view of the end of the world coming. Ladies, we better be on guard. We better be always watching ourselves, lest we fall from our own steadfastness. In fact, the word steadfastness has the idea of a strong foundation. Ladies, if your foundation this morning is not built on the solid rock of Jesus Christ, you're going to fall. You are going to fall. If Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone, is not your rock that you build your spiritual life on, you're going to fall. I had a lady call me last night who also has just lost her husband, and she said, what do you do to make this pain go away? Can't stand this pain. I said, yeah, it's hard. But I said, I pour my heart out to the Lord. I pray. I read his word. I be with good, godly friends. That's my foundation. And ladies, if you don't have a strong biblical foundation, you will fall. In fact, Jesus is very clear about this in the Sermon on the Mount. You know what he says? Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and doesn't do them is like a foolish man. What does he do? <laughs> he builds his house on what? Sand. And so when the trials of life come, the rains come, and the storms come, what happens? Well, when I was a little girl, we would say, it went smash. <laughs> you know, it fell completely. But Jesus says, if you're wise, you what? You build your house on the what? The rock. So storms come. The rock is Christ. The storms come. Everything in life falls apart. And what do you do? You stand firm. And that's what Peter is saying here. Build. Make sure that you are building your faith, not on a weak foundation, but on a solid foundation. That is Jesus Christ. Otherwise, ladies, you will fall and you will be devastated. So ladies, this is a final warning if you're taking notes. The final exhortation is this. Be constantly guarding yourself so that you do not fall. Be constantly guarding yourself so that you do not fall. Now maybe you're wondering, how does someone fall from their own steadfastness? Well, Peter writes, you want to know how you do it? By being led away with the error of the wicked. Being led away, interesting word. Turn over to Galatians 2. It's the same usage in Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2 is where it's mentioned that Barnabas was led away. This is the time that Paul uh, rebuked Peter, interesting enough. <laughs> Peter talked about Paul last week, and here we have Paul, the instance I was telling you about last week. But it's Galatians 2.11 Paul writes this in Galatians, Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face, because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came with James, he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas, here's the same Greek word, was carried away with their hypocrisy. What's going on here? Well, Peter was rebuked for what? Not eating with the Gentiles. Paul rebuked him, and notice the Jews were even also led away by this. So they got led away. They played the hypocrite. And then what happened? 
It caused Barnabas to be led away. So it all started with Peter. He didn't do with the right thing. Then the Jews saw this happening. They were led away. And then what happened then? Barnabas was led away. And it's interesting that this was a whole group, not just Peter, the Jews, and Barnabas. But when we go back to 2 Peter and he says, beware, at uh, least you fall from your own steadfastness, the led away there, he's talking about a group. He's not talking about an individual. He fears after his death that these readers will all fall away from their, whole, from their steadfastness, just like he witnessed uh, with Barnabas and the Jews when he himself uh, was rebuked by Paul. In fact, the way Peter puts it here in the Greek language is that there is a probability that after his death, the false teachers will be endeavoring to pull these readers away into their nets. Peter says, beware of this. At least you all <laughs> fall away from your own steadfastness. What a tender care Peter has for his flock. And ladies, he lovingly warns them. And you know, Paul did the same thing. Do you remember Paul in Acts chapter 20? He was saying goodbye to the elders at Ephesus. Remember they wept and fell, fell on him and they were crying. Remember what he says? I know this, after my departure, savage wolves are going to come in, not sparing the flock. And then he says, even of your own selves, even men on the elder board are going to draw away disciples after them. And he says, therefore, watch and remember. He says, I warned you for three years about this. I've warned you for three years. And yet Paul says, I know after I go, grievous wolves are going to come in and they're going to snatch you away. Peter's saying the same thing. Ladies, if the people in Paul's day, even elders, didn't stand on their steadfastness on the solid rock, even if some that Peter is writing to didn't stand, what makes us so smug? You know, like, well, I'm in a good solid church, or I read my Bible. We better beware, right? We've got to constantly be on guard that we do not fall from our own steadfastness now peter says you do this by the error of the wicked this is how we fall away what's the error of the wicked false teachers their doctrine it's interesting also the error of the wicked seems to be a reference to sodom and gomorrah remember we looked at that in chapter two um, the, so it's talking about what the depravity of false teachers their eyes are full of adultery and and they cannot cease from sin it's a moral depravity in other words false teachers who know no restraints to moral depravity they're wicked so it's not just they themselves are wicked what they teach is wicked and ladies we know who's behind all of this right who energizes false teachers satan Satan, he energizes all false teachers and all false teaching. And so Peter is warning his readers about the evil one and his influence. Beware. In fact, it's interesting, as I believe, that this is the same group of people that he wrote to in 1 Peter. And uh, even in 1 Peter, he warns the readers, be sober, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, is like a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour. And then he says something interesting. What? Resist him. Here's the words. Being what? Come on, girl. Steadfast. Are you guys awake? Stead. We haven't even had turkey yet, and you're already asleep. <laughs> Be what? Steadfast in your faith. He says that in 1 Peter chapter 5. He's saying it here in chapter 2. You want to know how to avoid the evil one, the devil, false teachers, perverted teaching? Be steadfast in your faith. Ladies, beware. Never think you're above leaving the faith. Never think you're above leaving the faith. How many have we seen in the last two years in the Christian circles fall away from the faith? Either because of moral departure or doctrinal departure. Don't think it can't happen to you. Paul warns in 1 Corinthians 10, 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed least he fall. And interesting enough, that admonition comes after reminding them of the Israelites in the wilderness that fell, and 23,000 died in one day. <laughs> 23,000 fell. They were led away from what? Their own steadfastness. In fact, even the Apostle Paul, do you know even the Apostle Paul was concerned that he might fall away? Do you know that? The Apostle Paul, he writes in 1 Corinthians 9, Therefore I run, not with uncertainty. I fight, not as one who beats the air. But he says, I discipline my body 
and bring it into subjection, least when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified, a castaway, an apostate. I remember years ago, my daughter told me, she said, Mom, the thing that my husband and I fear the most is apostasy. We fear that. We should have a healthy fear of that. And ladies, we should be very careful. Be on guard, Peter says, that you do not fall away from your own steadfastness. So friend, they've been warned, we've been warned not to fall away from the air of a wicked. We should dread the thought of falling away and endeavor to do our part. God keeps us, that is true. God keeps us, that is a promise. No one can pluck us out of the Father's hand. But ladies, we're responsible. We are responsible for our walks. In fact, the words here, our own steadfastness, even though Peter fears they all fall away, the word own there implies that it's your personal commitment to God's revealed truth. Ladies, you cannot depend on your spouse, on your best friend. I remember one time Doug and I had not been married maybe 10 years, and I was so intimidated by his knowledge of scripture and and, uh, you know, just the way he was, you know how he was, those of you that know him. And I remember I, you know, I never felt like I measured up. And so I remember one day I just, it just hit me. I was like, Susan, you're responsible for your own walk with the Lord. You can't depend on Doug Heck. You're not going to be standing in heaven holding his hand when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ and, you know, hope you get in because of, because of him. And I remember going up to him one day and he was sitting in his chair and I said, you know what? I'm just not intimidated by you anymore. I said, I'm going to, you know, pursue my own walk with the Lord. And he looked at me like, oh, what's gotten into you? But but I don't know, I found it very freeing because I thought, I better pursue my own steadfastness. I can't depend on Doug Heck. I can't depend on anyone. i got to depend on what? The Lord. And so, ladies, remember that. You pursue your own walk with the Lord. Instead of falling from our own steadfastness, we must do what Peter said in 2 Peter 1.10 that we've already seen. Remember, therefore, brethren, make diligent to make your calling and election sure. And then he gave us those virtues that we should be pursuing. Add to your faith virtue, virtue knowledge, knowledge self-control, self-control patience, patience godliness, to brotherly kindness love. And ladies, if you do these things, what did he say? You'll never fall. You want to know how to not to fall? Go back. In fact, maybe over the break, you need to go back to that lesson. Make sure you're doing those things. Now, ladies, I know I beat this drum often, and I'm going to beat it till I die. But you cannot afford to be sloppy with the Word of God. You cannot be sloppy. You can't be sloppy with your own personal holiness. It could mean your very soul will spend eternity in hell. Truth will keep you from being led away by false teachers, but we will not know truth by osmosis. It takes diligence, right? Peter's already reminded us of that. It takes discipline, as Paul says uh, in 1 Timothy 4. He says, bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable for all things, not just for this life, but the life to come. Also in 2 Timothy, he says, what? Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Well, we now turn from the final exhortation to the final encouragement, verse 18. What is it? He says, Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. So, ladies, instead of going astray, I grow aright. Instead of falling away from my own steadfastness, I forge ahead by standing firm. Instead of being led away by the error of the wicked one, I live by the truth of the word. Peter puts it like this, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, the word grow here means to increase in your understanding, and the Greek tense is, just like it was in verse, the very previous verse, a continual growing. Just like we're to continually be on guard that we don't fall, we are to be continually, constantly growing. Ladies, how do we grow? Well, Peter gives two ways here, but he also gives a way in his first epistle. Uh, first epistle of Peter, chapter 2, he says, As newborn babies, we are to desire the what? The pure milk of the word so that we can what? Grow. You want to know how to grow? By the pure milk of the word. Ladies, if you do not have an appetite for the word of God, like a newborn baby has an appetite for milk, there's something wrong with you. There's something wrong with your spiritual life. And, and, you know, I remember when my babies were little, 
and I nursed both of them. You know, I'd, I'd nurse them and put them down thinking, ah, you know, I can go do some. No, about two hours later, what? They want to eat again. They're I'm like, what do you mean you're hungry again? I just fed you, you know? That's what Peter's saying in his first epistle. Be like that newborn baby. You, you have time in the word or prayer, and you go about your day and go, oh, I need, I need that again. I, I've got to be constantly meditating day and night. Ladies, we should be yearning for God's word like that. As the deer pants for the water brook, we pant after him. If you starve your newborn baby, it will die. If you starve yourself as a Christian, you will die. In fact, Peter says desire what? Pure milk of the word. In fact, you know, they tell us the breast milk of a mother is the best milk for her baby over formulas. And you know why? Because it has natural immune fighters and it helps the baby grow. Think about what Peter's saying. God's word is the best nutrition for us, nutrition for us isn't it? Ladies, don't gravitate to devotional literature and, you know, all those bebop books. You know, they're, they're not going to help you. You want to spiritually grow? This is what you need. has the best nutrition for you. If you are feeding yourself spiritual junk, you're going to be stunted in your growth. If you feed your newborn baby junk, they're going to be malnourished, right? They need what is healthy Ladies, the word is a huge part of how we grow, but Peter also mentions two ways here in 2 Peter, how we grow. Notice what he says. We go in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does it mean to grow in grace? Well, one man helps us here, and I want you to listen up. He says, growing in grace often means experiencing trials and even suffering. We never really experience the grace of God until we are at the end of our resources, the lessons learned in the school of grace are always costly lessons, but they are worth it. To grow in grace means to become more like the Lord Jesus, from whom we receive all the grace we need. Ladies, before the passing of my husband a few months ago, I can honestly say I did not know certain graces of the Lord Jesus Christ to the depth I do now. In fact, this morning, my daughter's here from Houston, and she was in my room while I was getting ready, and I said, Cindy, I just can't believe everything the Lord's done for me since your dad's passed. And she goes, what? Like what? So I went to my journal. I said, here, I'll read you my big list. <laughs> I did not know the depth of his care, his compassion, his protection, his provision. No one understands or cares for me like Jesus does. I would not know about him to the depth I do not know. I know him now without the trial of him taking my husband home. You know, sometimes we shrink from suffering. We shrink from trials. But, ladies, that is where we come to know his grace. That is otherwise impossible. My friend, embrace suffering. Embrace trials. You will know more of him, not just from his word, but from his grace. That's exactly what Peter's saying. Grow in grace. Grow. Accept the trials that he brings into your life as a gift from him. That experience will become a reality as you feel and sense the grace of Christ. Secondly, Peter says we not only grow in grace, but we grow in knowledge. And he's not talking about a biblical knowledge here. Uh, that he mentions in the first epistle, but a knowledge actually that is personal knowledge. In fact, the same man helps us uh, when he talked about growing in grace, about growing in knowledge. He says this, we must also grow in knowledge. How easy it is to grow in knowledge, but not in grace. All of us know far more of the Bible than we really live. Knowledge without grace is a terrible weapon, and grace without knowledge can be very shallow. But when we combine grace and knowledge, we have a marvelous tool for building our lives and for building the church, end of quote. Ladies, now notice as Peter closes, he says this grace and knowledge that we're to grow in is that of who? The Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. Ladies, listen up. We cannot just know the Bible. We have to know what the author of the Bible the grace and knowledge comes through the author of the Bible. We must know God, but we must know him as our Lord, our master, our owner, 
And we must know him through his son, Jesus Christ. Ladies, if you do not have a relationship with the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, you will not understand grace and knowledge. You will not understand it. You can learn facts about Jesus and God, all that in the Bible, but without knowing him in an intimate way, you're just going to have head knowledge. That's all you're going to have. And demons have that. <laughs> demons have head knowledge, and they have a sense to what? Tremble, which is more than we have. We don't tremble at all. We can know him and his writings, but if we do not know the author, his letters will not make much sense to us. In fact, I remember when I fell in love with Doug Heck 47 years ago now. We were students at Moody Bible Institute, and uh, we didn't have cell phones in those days. I know some of you young girls do not understand life without cell phones, but really, it was a great life. And uh, he actually wrote me handwritten letters. And I could hardly wait till my classes were over every day so that I could go to my P.O. box and pull out letters from Doug Heck. And then I would go to the seventh floor, and I'd read them, and I'd read them over and over again. Then my roommate from Texas would get out of her classes, and I'd say, listen to what Doug wrote. And she's like, oh, boy. And I'd read, her, read my letters to her. And I still have all the letters that Doug wrote me. They're in a shoebox, and uh, every once in a while I take them out and read them. And I cherish them. Why? Because I'm in love with the author. If I did not have a personal relationship with Doug Heck, those letters would have no meaning to me whatsoever. Ladies, that's it is the way with our relationship with the Lord, with God. That's what Peter is saying. We grow in the grace and knowledge of what? This poem we have an intimate relationship with. He's left you 66 letters. Do you know them? Can't wait to read them? Do you read them over and over again? That's what Peter's saying. Grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know what's in this word? And are they precious to you? Because you know the author. You know the author. Well, the final exhortation then from Peter is this. Be constantly growing so that you're never full. <laughs> Be constantly growing so you're never full. Ladies, there is no way in a lifetime that any of us will ever exhaust the word of God. You will not exhaust the word of God. You will never exhaust the personal grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We should be like that newborn baby that's never satisfied, always coming back for more milk. <laughs> We should be like that newborn that always wants to come back to the word of God until we're full. And then you know what? We're full. And then, you know, sometimes when I'm studying the word of God, it's like, man, I have to take a break. <laughs> I got to take a break because it kind of burn, burns brain cells when you're studying. But then I'm like, well, I got to go back to it again, right? Because we're hungry again. We want more of his word. You know, one day we're not going to hunger or thirst anymore. Isn't that going to be great? Revelation 7, 14 says, we will hunger no more, neither thirst anymore. Isn't that going to be great? Why? Because we'll be before the throne of God, and what? He, he will be there, so we won't hunger and thirst anymore. And I love the part where it says God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Isn't that going to be a great day? Well, Peter ends with these words, to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Now and forever is literally, in the Greek, now and for the day of eternity. It's like he's saying, a day lasts forever. I know some of you feel like a day lasts forever. And it's very similar to what we saw. One day is with a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. It's similar to what Psalm 94 says. A thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it's past, and like a watch in the night. What's Peter saying? Eternity is nothing to God. Time passes neither slow or fast. And what's he saying? He's going to have the glory now. And for all eternity. And he had the glory in the past too, right? He's always had the glory. Because in the beginning, what? God. He's always been. And ladies, we can choose to grow now and be more like him, which brings him glory. Or we can go to the way of the false teachers we have considered and bring him glory as his wrath will be displayed. As Romans 9.21 talks about vessels of wrath fit for destruction, which also brings him glory. Well, Peter then ends with amen, which actually was added later. It's not in the original manuscripts, but even if it were, it just means so be it, right? One man sums it up like this. As you review this important epistle, you cannot help but be struck by the urgency of the message. 
The apostates are here. They're busy. <laughs> They're seducing immature Christians. We must be guarding, growing, and glorifying the Lord, making the most of every opportunity to win the lost and strengthen the saved, end of quote. So the final exhortation is to be constantly guarding yourself so that you never fall. How are you guarding yourself so that you do not waver in your faith? Do you know the false teachers of our day and what they teach? Do you avoid listening to them or even entertaining their nonsense? What biblical plan of action do you have in place right now that will aid you in guarding your heart and mind from the attacks of the evil one? Ladies, be constantly guarding yourself so that you do not fall. The final encouragement is what? Be constantly growing so that you are never full. How much spiritual food do you eat on a regular daily basis? Are you growing in personal grace and knowledge of the Lord? Do you allow the trials of life to aid in knowing the personal grace of God? How have you personally got to know him better through your trials? Well, as we close our study in 2 Peter as your teacher, I would like to lovingly remind you to remember the precious truths that we have studied. Please remember the peace, the promise, the person, and the power of Christ. And don't forget to make your calling and election sure. Remember, do not follow fables, but follow the sure word of prophecy. Follow the sacred scriptures. And please do not forget the false teachers of our day and their dangerous, deceptive doctrines. Remember the sobering example of Sodom and Gomorrah, the sinning angels and the scoffers. Remember the truth that God will deliver the godly out of temptation. Remember the ferocious flood from the past and the future fire that one day will happen, maybe sooner than we think. <laughs> remember to think of God's amazing attributes as we face the end of the world. And remember how you are to live while we wait. And of course, remember, guard yourself so that you do not fall and continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Will you remember these truths? I pray you will. In closing, I'd like to pray. It was um, come up. I try to read a prayer out of the Valley of Vision every morning, and this one came up this morning, and I thought it was a great way to end our time. So if you would bow your heads, and I want to read this. Compassionate Lord, thy mercies have brought me to the dawn of another day. Vain will it be unless I grow in grace, increase in knowledge, ripened for spiritual harvest, let me know this day that you are who you say you are, that you love supremely. Help me to serve you wholly, admire you fully. Through grace, let my will respond to thee, knowing that power to obey is not in me, but that thy free love alone enables me to serve thee. Here then is my empty heart. Overflow it with your choicest gifts. Here is my blind understanding. Chase away its mist of ignorance. O oh, ever watchful shepherd, lead, guide, tend me this day. Without thy restraining rod, I err and stray. Hedge up my path, lest I wander into unwholesome pleasure and drink its poisonous streams. Direct my feet, that I be not entangled in Satan's secret snares, nor fall into his hidden traps. Defend me from assailing foes, from evil circumstances from myself. My adversaries are part and parcel of my nature. They cling to me as my very skin. I can't escape their contact. In my rising up and sitting down, they barnacle me. They entice with constant baits. My enemy is within the citadel. Come with almighty power, cast him out, pierce him to death, and abolish in me every particle of carnal life this day. And Father, I do pray that that would be our heart, that we would grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you would keep us from evil and the evil one. I ask this for Christ's sake and his glory. Amen. Thank you for watching Susan Hex with the Master YouTube channel. I am Pam Sheehan. Susan is my friend and mentor, and I tape, edit, manage Susan's YouTube channel. 
I can attest that Susan loves bringing the Word of God to the women of God in order to help us grow in our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. If you would like to be part of this growing group of growing women, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel, hit that bell to be notified when we post new content, and please feel free to share this video with your friends and your family. And finally, clicking that thumbs up is always appreciated. If you would like to financially support this ministry, please go to Susan's webpage at www.withthemaster, all one word, dot org. At the top of the page is a pink donate button that will take you to our church's homepage, Grace Community Church of Tulsa. This is where Susan's ministry receives elder oversight. To donate to Susan, click on the drop-down menu in the To box and select With the Master Susan Heck. Then continue to complete the form and follow the prompts. Your gift to Susan will help support this ministry in its goal of blessing women with the eternal words of our living God. Thank you for watching.